Hi everyone, welcome to uh, an hour along with uh, George Gachara from Nairobi. Um, George, let me just quickly give it over to you. We have let, we've got a little bit less than an hour, it's a little bit over two. Um, so have a lot of fun and um, see you in a little bit. George. Thank you. Uh, my name is George once again, uh, and I'm glad to be part of this um, uh, webinar. It's, uh, it's my first time to use this tool. So I'm, I'm also uh, getting used to it. Uh, welcome to my house. Uh, in Kenya today is a public holiday. And so I get to work from home and speak to you from, um, from home. So welcome to my house in Nairobi. Um, I, I was requested to have a conversation uh, with you uh, concerning several things and and in my in my thinking I thought that we should explore um, different conversations uh, the first conversation that I thought we should explore as a uh, together is a conversation on, uh, around what are the roles of uh, conscious citizenship and how do we uh, as people who work around uh, uh, social justice issues um, or social in the field of social innovation, how do we locate ourselves at home? And so that then, uh, in, I mean, at the, in the places we call home, uh, that's the first area of this conversation. Um, the second area of this conversation would be exploring how to find a voice and watch, or which tools to use. Um, and I'll give my personal experiences in this. And third, as requested by the um, organizers, um, to share my experiences around the Stories of Our Lives film project, which is the most recent uh, project that uh, my uh, my team has done. And, and so, and so, I guess I should. Uh, well, I'm trying to figure this out. I should just start off right away. So the first thing is, uh, I'll give you an introduction of myself. Uh, my name is George Gashara. Uh, I am a, um, sorry, I don't know. Let's 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 figure. Let, let me put this to the to the screen so that all of you can see it. Full, full screen mode. There we go. Uh, my name is George Gashara. I am a cultural activist, uh, a designer of learning programs for over seven years. Uh, I love cycling, and I'm also a co-director at the Nest, um, which is a uh, or whose work at the NEST is going to form the basis of some of my reflections today. Now, the NEST is a multidisciplinary arts and collective space um, where we bring in cool people, thinkers, artists, curious minds, to collaborate in creating uh, projects that are socially conscious and that also critique the spaces in which we live. Um, my particular interests uh, around uh, exploring the intersections of identity, history, and power in order to create human spaces and build communities uh, around that. And I'll explain my, how I, uh, my, my, my work around that. So to go around, the, I mean, to go directly to our first exploration, when I was asked to um, lead this conversation, I, I, I sent a bit of uh, uh, content for you to read. And one of the pieces that I sent was, um, was one of the, it was an easy, easy, easy how do you call this? Um, it, was a, it was a paper by J. Baldwin. James Baldwin was a civil rights leader in America. And he writes in this easy, in, 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 in this paper, uh, which is titled A Talk to Teachers. Um, and, and why I'm using this is because I feel like everyone who's involved in the value chain of, uh, of social innovation is in one way or another teaching or innovating around society. And this is, and this is important for us to contextualize. And he begins by saying that um, one of the paradoxes of, our, of, of, of education is that precisely at the point when you begin to develop your or develop a conscience, 
you must find yourself at war with society. It is your responsibility to change society if you think yourself as an educated person. So I think about this a lot of times, and then I also think about broadly the concept of education and changing society. Because all of us, and especially around the HIVOS Award, are social innovators who are deeply embedded in our own societies. Yeah? And so I assume that um, in this correlation, when we're talking about education, we're talking about you understanding your, con your, your society and then deciding that there are things in your society that should be but are not. A, a kind of education that tells you that only you can do certain things because they're not being done. And so as a, as a, as a conscious citizen, I think it is our responsibility that for as long as we find ourselves educated by our, our, our lives, our society, uh, economics, food, polit politics and power, uh, gender issues, and the many other things that we deal with um, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum of social innovation, is that for as long as we start to become conscious people, then we constantly find ourselves at war with our society. And then therefore there are words like activism that come about because if you are a conscious person and you realize that, that, uh, that ta there's unjust, unjust tax, tax laws in your country uh, and that vulnerable people are um, facing uh, hardships because of a certain law, then you start to become uncomfortable and people call you an activist. And so I am, I am looking at uh, collapsing these titles, uh, activism and social innovation and uh, conscious art into one smoothie of people who are being educated by their ecosystems and are trying to create solutions within their time. And so, uh, James Baldwin says, I would try to, to make each child, and so this is if I was a teacher, I would try to make each child know that these things are a result of a criminal conspiracy to destroy him. And in this context, he is talking about racism. I would teach him that if he intends to grow to be a man, he must at once decide that he is stronger than this conspi conspiracy and that he must never make peace with it. What I get out of this is that James Baldwin is saying that for as long as you're working with a society that's dealing with a deprivation, a deprivation of uh, rights, a deprivation of public uh, services, a deprivation of, of uh, expression or recognition or whatever other area uh, of social innovation you're working with, you must never make peace with this. And that, and I continue reading, and that one of his weapons for refusing to make peace with this and for destroying it depends on what he decides he is worth. So generally, back to the question of citizenship, what does a citizen think he is worth in his own society? What do we think that our own societies owe us? And what do we think is our role to make this place we call home habitable? So that's the general like conceptual place that I'm coming from about being a conscious citizen and locating yourself within, within your own society. And in my case, it's been a long journey. Uh, at age 15, I was involved in, um, in uh, children's, uh, ch children's rights work uh, when the world was uh, busy uh, creating legislation or global treaties around children's rights. Um, because as a child, I felt constantly that my, my peers are dropping out of school uh, for lack of sanitary towels. My peers are getting married off 
early, um, young people who do not have access to resources to go into private schools or expensive government schools uh, deserve uh, equal chance, like myself, to be uh, for their education to be funded by by the state. And so, constantly and uh, continuously, as always, located within my society, within my generation, in my struggle. And at the beginning, um, the kind of language that we used at the time was policy language. Our work was to agitate for policy change. And so I was involved in numerous conversations, even at a young age, presenting sort of like the voice of, of children. Later in life, I was involved in the youth movement in my country. Um, and the language at the time was uh, language of institutions. So we wanted a youth policy um, made, a youth and employment policy made, and out of that there would be a youth national youth council. And so there were institutions, the language and frameworks of institutions to create social change. And gradually, uh, I've been involved in, in exploring different languages uh, that you can use to to create an environment through which um, the society learns and reflects about the place that it is. And so, uh, and so in one of the readings I gave you is a paper I wrote in 2012, well, it's an article about the role of art. Because at the beginning of, uh, at, in 2007, I worked in a project um, that was a post-conflict reconstruction project where we used images and photographs, and we put a large exhibitions in all cities across the country um, for citizens to reflect and dialogue about their role in the post-election violence, which was our worst election violence since independence as a country. And as a result, using the language of art, images, and conversation, uh, we allowed over 2 million people across the country to, to start to reflect about what citizenship means to them, what tribalism, what belonging to a certain tribe means to them, and, and what being in a nation as many tribes, because we are 40, 42 different tribes in our country, what that means, how do you negotiate? Um, uh, how do you negotiate uh, the national versus the tribal? And so I felt at the time when I was writing this article that gradually I am loving the language of art. And I said that the arts play a central role in allowing and helping to construct these critical decisions, critical personal decisions. It is through art that we access ongoing reflections on our society that the arts allow our minds to create solutions. Uh, they grieve and roar in pain and anger. Uh, they know when things aren't fair and they speak out and they encourage us to think and to feel along with the people who are oppressed. For me, art persuades us that things can be made right and whole. If even just for a few fleeting moments, we are reminded that the individual can do great things and much, and much more can be achieved if, if many individuals act together. I believe that the arts can also help us unravel the tensions between our need for personal autonomy as individuals and the responsibilities that come with belonging to a group, such as tribes, such as, such as social classes, different generations, countries or counties or nations. Huh? It is true that expression and democracy uh, can only thrive in a condition of freedom. And freedom for citizens to create, to define, to experiment, and to, and to explore the world of the human mind and the spirit while taking responsibilities of their own lives. So let me try to make a connection here. At the beginning, I, um, I, I, I introduced the idea of, of the conscious citizen. And all of us, um, especially in this program, are conscious citizens, firmly located within the experiences of our home, you know, in the different projects that we do, with the visions that we have. 
but it is also important that even within the location that we have chosen, I locate myself as a young um, social innovator, uh, uh, young leader um, in my country, uh, who is a middle class young person, fairly educated, and has a, a certain vision of the future. Uh, I, I locate myself as a as a thinker, writer, and a builder of, uh, of, 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 of projects. Uh, however you, lo you locate yourself in your own society, then you must start to find a language through which uh, you, can, you can start to build your vision of what your society is. And I've been going through some of your projects and I've seen some people uh, found amazing language in agriculture trying to create uh, uh, urban farming solutions uh, in which they tell people that uh, even in the urban areas you can find food or climate change solutions or communication solutions. And all these are languages through which you start to express your vision for your own society. Well. Um, I think the third exploration that I want us to go through, because I only have 15 minutes, and then we open to your um, questions and answers, is the reflection around my recent work, uh, which was the um, Stories of Our Lives film project. Um, so first I will, I, will, I will show you a film, a short film, uh, and then and then we'll have conversations around that. So let me figure out where this film is. Yes, here we go. Uh, here we go. Let me just briefly uh, say that thank you very much. The, uh, the I think the film clip was a little bit crummy because of the connection. Uh, it may be that not everybody has seen it very well, but I posted the link once more um, to the chat and also to the channel that we're all on. So I, I think most of you will already have seen it. It's beautiful. Thanks. Oh, so should I send the link? Uh, no, I just I just. I've, I've just posted the link to everybody um, okay. and, I, and I did already yesterday night. So I think most people will have seen it or will be able to look at it afterwards. Okay, thank you. So should I just see it? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think I will proceed uh, with my presentation. Thing is, is that um, so at the beginning of this year, um, and I'm linking this to the other, con the uh, first two conversations that we've had about citizenship, finding our voice, and um, finding tools. Um, at the Nest, um, one of our most recent projects is amongst the many projects that we've done in, for the last two and a half years of our existence is a, sto is a film, a Stories of Our Lives. Um, and so the Stories of Our Lives film started as a, as a curiosity because we are a, an artistic community of over 700 people 
And within our community, we have um, all identities represented. And there are people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex. And they fit uh, very well within our community. And as a, res as a result of what has been happening in Africa, uh, there's been a conversation um, around Africa that says that uh, queer people or gay people are um, are not in are not uh, are not African. Um, I remember back in 2012, um, I wrote an article that was uh, published in the International Political Forum uh, about the two mainstream African arguments that I that I have refused to accept. And one of them was around the uh, gender inequalities in political representation, and we called it the politics of motherliness. And the second thing, uh, and which is a big, uh, is still a big uh, political argument, an identity argument, is that indeed homosexuality is an African. And so we 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 sought to um, do a project that tries to. Um, to, to, to ask relevant questions around uh, gender identity, uh, sexual, represent, uh, uh, sexual minorities representation around the country. So for 18 months, we went around the country collecting audio stories of uh, people who accepted to give us interviews, our friends, our relatives, um, our teachers, um, government officials, uh, prison warders, people in prison. And after 18 months, we had about 250 uh, audio stories uh, in our archive. And as a result, we started to shoot uh, small film projects. Um, initially, they were not supposed to be like a big film or anything like that. But they were together with the team. Um, for as long as a story proved to be um, a story that we had collected, proved to be very uh, visual, then we, we, we converted it quickly into a, into a script and uh, shot small little uh, pieces. Then sometime in August this year, or around the time, um, a lady called uh, Russia from the Toronto International Film Festival visited our office and um, asked if we would, uh, I mean, and, and she got a chance to see what we were working on. And she said she was interested, interested in screening the short little pieces uh, at the Toronto International Festival. Then it just occurred to us that the, the pieces that we were making, um, because we wanted to make short pieces of stories of people that could be shared uh, easily on the internet, shared in popular places, to start to actually clarify the lives of people within uh, the non-gender and non-heterosexual gender identities, sexual and uh, gender identities. And so we put the films together, uh, and then for some reason they became 60 Minutes, and that was a feature film. Um, and we had a good uh, opportunity to screen this to our community. Um, to screen this to our friends and families uh, before before taking it to Toronto for the film festival, which is quite a big deal, um, because it was also our first uh, feature film to go to a big international festival. Uh, then yes, we indeed screened it at the international film festival, and because we received a lot of favorable responses, um, we decided to come back to Kenya and now screen it. Uh, as a film to uh, our citizens, to, to, our, to our country. And uh, upon our return, um, the film was banned. We submitted it for classification, as is the law. It was banned from any screenings, distribution, and exhibition in Kenya. And later, uh, the government uh, uh, instituted a criminal case against myself and my team. And as a result, uh, we, uh, I feel that there is the connection of the theories that I was trying to explain earlier, that first we look at ourselves as young people within our society who have actually, um, within a small community or larger community, uh, call it urban, call it whatever, that 
we've accepted that our identities are beyond uh, the mainstream accepted identities. And as a result of locating ourselves in that place, that we, we are conscious that our gender identities and uh, sexual orientations are more uh, than what is prescribed in the mainstream, and that we wanted to use to the tools of film, music, and uh, photography, and text to tell these stories, um, then our work um, actually uh, became that the government responds we, uh, to using violence and, and using uh, law. And so my reflection so far is that um, along the line uh, in my work, I have been very lucky uh, to find projects or to find myself in relationships and in work that allows uh, myself to be located within my, my time, uh, my generation, and also to be dealing with some of the controversial issues, cultural issues of the time. Uh, at the beginning it was uh, child labor and, and child marriages. Later uh, in life it was um, uh, peace and conflict. And now um, the idea that there are, there are gender identities and sexual orientations that are not allowed to be discussed, uh, to be consumed, to be accepted within the mainstream understanding, while we have people, uh, indigenous people, indigenous histories of people who are outside of the mainstream uh, accepted uh, definitions. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, it's very interesting to find myself there yet again. And so, um, and so I go back to my earlier quote uh, by, by James that uh, um, I began by saying that one of the paradoxes of education, I'm using the word education largely, was that precisely at the point when you begin to develop a conscience that you must find yourself at war with your society and it is your responsibility indeed to change society if you think yourself as an educated person. So I suppose then um, my presentation today is for all of us, if we think ourselves educated then we'll get to a point and I think a lot of us are when we find ourselves at war with our own societies, and I'm using the word war largely, it could be a conflict, it could be a conversation, but you're at odds with your society. And it is your responsibility indeed to change your society if you think yourself a, an educated person. So I guess that's the sum of my presentation today. I want to open up for uh, questions so that then now I can I can interact with you. Uh, uh, yes, tell me whether... Um, Thank you. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Thanks uh, so much. Then, uh, then I'll address them. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, George, for your inspiring talk and presentation. There was one small issue with that um, movie clip you showed, but it was um, in the reading list I posted yesterday, and I just posted it again. Uh, <clears throat> on the chat here. So everybody who did not see that YouTube video well, the trailer, you can review it in that reading list of yesterday and and I can even post it again if you wish. <clears throat> so thanks, uh, George. So I don't say that again. Yes, so about so the that, video. Uh, please speak slowly. slowly. Okay. So about that yes. video uh, you showed. Yes. I posted a link again because not everybody can uh, yes. can see it well over their connection. I have a question, George, oh, from... Should I play with you? No, no, that's not... That's not the, the problem is uh, the connection over this tool. So people can look at it later okay. or have already seen it. It was posted yesterday already. Thanks. There's a question by uh, Opeyemi. Opeyemi, I'm... Yes. Opeyemi? Hello. Okay, um, uh, 
Hello, yeah, I'm here. Hello, George. Can you hear me? Hello, George. Hello, how are you? Hello, George. Can you... I'm fine, George. My name is Okoyemi from Nigeria. From where? Nigeria. Nigeria. Nigeria, yes. Okoyemi from Nigeria. And um, first of all, I would like to commend your, um, your, your ability to stand out and then your ability to stand for change and for positive positivity in society and then towards mentality shift about what the society is trying to uh, stigmatize. The policy in Kenya about uh, homosexuality is uh, is the same in Nigeria here and then it's yes. so bad that uh, you have to stigmatize your friends, you have to stigmatize your family and then you have to stigmatize almost everybody you know who has been hiding in the closet. So I mean, what I really need to know. I mean, I mean, right now, while you were talking, I honestly, okay, while you were talking now, I honestly yes. wish I was in the shoes. But I really want to know the passion. I mean, how, how did you come to that point where you decided to stand and say, no matter what the society thinks about this, I will stand and use my resources to further this cause. And then the challenge is how. I mean, I'm sure you have people on your side that are families and friends that are, don't even support what you're doing. How have you been able to stand out? How have you been able to say, okay, no, this is the part I'm taking, and uh, despite the fact that I'm having the tide against me, I will stand. Thank you very much, George. Well, thank you. Um... Uh, I, I I would like to respond um, by saying uh, I mean uh, the, the the exact question of how how did I get to the point that I can stand? Thing is, is over time I have developed clarity as to what my values are, and part of my values are respect of people respect of uh, individual choices as long as people are um, not hurting one another um, as long as people indeed um, feel and know that um, they are who they are you know I have friends I have um, relatives um, who are uh, and I've grown up with people who are gay or who are lesbians. Um, and seeing the kind of life that they have to go through, um, I start to wonder, um, is it important that the main, that, that the story, especially the story in Africa, where we say gay people don't exist, is it important for that narrative to exist if there are people who are killed daily, who are uh, thrown out of their homes, who are refused employment um, just because they are different. And my idea, um, I mean, my interaction with difference has been, has been there for a long time. Uh, in my country, as is in Nigeria, uh, differences have been exploited uh, to cause pain and hurt and deprivation to people. Um, in our cases, in our case, we have um, uh, we have uh, had many tribal wars. Uh, I know, like the Biafra War of um, of Nigeria, uh, we have cases like that in Kenya, and and the whole idea be, be behind Boko Haram and the religious differences that people exploit these differences to to hurt other people, and I feel strongly against that. And if I stand by the truth of my, of, of, on the integrity of my life, I cannot support that. And so this is just one of the projects that we've done, and there are many others that, um, that actually allow us to make a film uh, that's that gay people indeed exist, and this is how they love, and this is how they hurt, and this is what we do to them. Unfortunately, that is not uh, uh, popular with the mainstream. By uh, the government would respond by 
by taking us to court. I hope I have you. Hello? Is there any other question? George, can you um, hear me? Um, okay, there we go. Hello. 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 Hi, George. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Chamla from Sri Lanka. And uh, I'd like to ask about something specific to my project because my project is on environmental conservation and we are working with rivers and miners. And I would like to know what would be the like ways of incorporating uh, culture and arts into my project, the environmental conservation work. Uh, kindly say that again slowly. My internet is a bit slow. Uh, shall I type it out? Please repeat. Uh, uh, my project is on environmental conservation. And yes, we are working with, yeah, we are working with river sand miners, and we want to change their attitudes. Yes. And make them stop river sand mining and introducing them with uh, alternative livelihoods. Yes. Okay. So yes. how should we use uh, culture and art aspects into this project? How should we incorporate them? Okay. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, question um, because I feel that um, generally the culture and the arts for us who are in uh, um, social innovation are a lot more tools that uh, that um, are not available with uh, with, uh, with policy work that are not available with legal work. Uh, because the good thing, if you are in trending to look at cultural attitudes and behaviors, uh, art speaks to people individually. I'll give you an example. Uh, during the worst violence in Kenya, um, there was one musician who sang a song that at the time of the violence, when everyone was um, afraid, uh, when this song would play, everyone would feel peaceful. It was it is called Daima Mim in Kenya. It was just a patriotic song. It was better and more useful sometimes, even right now in my country, than the national anthem. That whenever uh, you hear this song playing, everyone feels patriotic. Um, uh, it's called Forever Kenyan. Um, so I'm trying to say how you can integrate um, culture and, and, and art into your work. Um, there are two levels of integrating. The first level, people say, how do we make our med messages more appealing? And so sometimes you get a graphic designer or you get an artist to perform during um, uh, the launch of your of your project, you get music to be performed before speeches, and that's one way of doing it, um, uh, using art to convene attention. Um, the second part is using art and culture as the environment through which you cause change. So, so to ask yourself, um, how do people change their habits do they change their habits because they are told, or do they change their habits because um, because they, they they think they should? How do people change their spending habits? How do people change their... Um, so when you ask yourself that question, and you start to see 
Um, how then do you start to influence people using art? Um, then for me, it's very simple. It's um, how do you create new tools for conversation? How do you use theater as, uh, as the way in which minors can have dialogue around the things that you want, around the environmental things that you want? So instead of theater being um, the entertainment, it becomes the main uh, tool through which people have dialogue. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, if you go to Latin America, uh, there's a guy called Augusto Boal, who, uh, who has written a lot around using theater for, for dialogue, for mediation, for reflection, and for behavior change. So if you use a tool like forum theater, where, um, where people play out a scenario, maybe it's a scenario that, you, that the miners do, uh, if, if it's a thing that you want to change, you make them play out that scenario on stage. And then you tell them if they see something wrong happening on stage, they can raise their hands and they say why they, if they think it is wrong and what they should do to change it. And so gradually you start to involve people in changing their mindset about the things that they indeed are doing within an environment that is not judgmental. And that is using integrating art within your work. So I'm sure we can have many more conversations um, specifically around how to integrate dialogue and art within your work. Um, but, there, but there are definitely two levels. There's the one for convening attention, and there's another one where you use art in and of itself as a medium. So, so I feel that uh, there are many tools available that you can start to explore, um, and I'll definitely be uh, grateful to assist you to take a look at some of them. Yeah, thank you. Like, uh, yeah, I should be able to work on something and then get your support in uh, incorporating this into my proposal. Yes. Hope you can support. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thanks. I will. I will. I'll write my email address, and you can always uh, uh, email me, and that we can uh, have a conversation around that. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jamila, for the uh, for the uh, question and George, of course. I will um, I will spread um, the email address you share with me on the Slack channel. We are all on, so we can um, each and one of us can uh, come with later questions. Come to you. I've got two more questions. One by Etienne, um, and I'll put you on sound right now, Etienne. Etienne. All right. Hello, this is Etienne from Germany, but I'm in another country, Uganda, at the moment. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Please speak slowly. Hello. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is Etienne in, in Uganda at the moment. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and especially for your activism beyond the conventional and digging into, into topics that that many people don't want to speak about and many people are afraid of maybe digging into. So my question goes on in that line. As well, um, especially in Uganda, the, the, the topic about homosexuality has been much, much debated over the last months and years, and it's been really, really in a big crisis. But um, what is your strategy of of not being stereotyped or or putting into in, putting yourself into dangerous territory yourself if you're an activist or if you want to do if you want to create awareness for topics that people don't normally want to speak about? And secondly. In our social innovation academy, students come up with projects that, that Sorry, uh, get into Please repeat your first question again. I got it halfway. OK. It's about how do you protect yourself if you're an activist of not going beyond the limit that you are become endangered as well. Because if you dig into topics that some people see very critically or some people are against, then there's a fine line where you might be become in danger as well. Like there's a few activists in Uganda that have been killed because of that. So um, that's one question. And the second part is, if you're an activist and if you're an artist, especially, um, how do you make a living out of that? Or how, how are you able to sustain yourself? Because unfortunately, in, especially in East Africa, I think there's not a big market for, for art or people that are not able to market their things outside of, of Africa. I've seen a lot of my friends, they, they're not able to survive on that, and then they have to change to some other things, although they love arts. 
So what do you think is why is the people that want to go into arts? Because you know, Social Innovation Academy, that's one thing that we want people to go into as well as arts, and people are really motivated. But it's hard for them to find a way of really making a living out of that and survive. So that's the second question. OK. Um, please correct me if I'm right. Um, is the first question about, uh, uh, I, I, I try to listen, but my connection is uh, not very clear. Is the first uh, question about uh, the danger um, that activists go through? Yes, the dangers, but also how do you protect yourself that you don't become targeted as well if you want to support people that are already targeted? Okay. Um, first thing is that um, about danger as, a, as, a, as, an, as an activist, obviously uh, going into this project and uh, um, seeing what has been happening in the region, um, especially with the uh, anti-homosexuality law in, um, in uh, Uganda, the, um, the um, anti-homosexuality and the violence in uh, Nigeria against homosexuals, um, the rape culture in South Africa, and also the passive aggression in Kenya, we were always aware that this was a tough place to locate our work. So we took quite a bit of precautions at the beginning where we, 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 we took the interviews uh, uh, in confidence and made sure that even if they were confiscated by officials and government, they could never be traced back to the respondents because there were anonymous audio interviews and the archiving was, um, was uh, we got really interesting tools, uh, secure tools to archive. Um, second thing was the security uh, of the crew of, of the of the actors and the artists. So um, first, all the artists that were involved in this project were well briefed about the potential risks of the project, um, and so everyone who did the work was well aware of the worst case scenario, which would be sometimes to even run away from the country if it got that bad. Um, the third thing that we did was the security of the, uh, of the crew. So uh, we first uh, complied legally with all uh, the legal um, uh, and the licensing and taxation regimes that we needed to. Um, we got a safe house, uh, we got a security plan, for both the artists and the crew, um, and so and we got a lawyer, a, 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 a start a lawyer, um, legal lawyer, and um, and obviously this was not happening in isolation, that we were in a network of communities that were uh, aware of this work and were supportive of this work, both human rights, legal, and sometimes even police. Um, so really. The precautions that we took were the necessary precautions for the work to happen. We obviously could not know uh, that we will go to court or that the work would be banned. Um, but then, at least at the very basic, we were prepared um, uh, if such an eventuality happened, and indeed it did. And um, so generally, we build our resilience, our communication, um, process and so I feel that the most important security for us was the community in which the work was being done. It was not just the queer community, um, it was the human rights community, artists, storytellers and so there were many people who, who appreciated the work so there were a lot of resources around our work. That's, a first, that's your first question. Um, so, 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 so there was a lot of resources that we could tap into within our ecosystem. The second question is how do activists and artists earn a living from their work? Um, which is a very interesting question and um, 
and for us we look at it in two ways that um, that uh, uh, not all art should be commercial because some of it cannot be commercial and so we have to find models that sustain work that is not commercial um, so for example at the nest uh, where I work um, we are 50 percent um, we're about 50 percent donor funded and 50 percent self funded uh, from income from our different projects and so our aim is to be at least 70% uh, um, self-funded um, by the time it's uh, by our fourth year, which is in our strategic plan, and, and that is going well. So that the work that cannot be commercialized continues to happen, like stories of our lives um, and many other artistic projects, uh, conscious artistic projects that we do. But on the other hand, the, the, there is another part of artwork that is design. Um, and so we have a project as the NEST, we are calling it the HIVA, HIVA Fund project. And if you look at your screen right now, um, uh, uh, HIVA Fund is trying to create um, solutions for actually East African solution, uh, solutions for uh, the creative economy, so that then we can create linkages with the market, market financing, commercial financing with the arts, so that then um, the arts that can be commercialized can indeed actually um, find investments. So this is also a conversation that, uh, that can go forward. If you're online, you can, um, go to the contact page of HIVA Fund and uh, we can engage in further conversations because I'm part of the HIVA Fund team um, that's trying to create uh, innovative solutions around East Africa. So I hope I have tried to address your questions. Thanks um, uh, for that. I'm sorry to interfere a little bit because uh, we have only two minutes left in this session um, and the tool is actually quite ruthless, so it will just drop us once we're uh, over that hour. Um, I've got one more question by Ugundele, open, and I can start another session if people want that. If people can just raise their hand if they, if they do, and we can just start a new session, I will invite everyone, and we can go into, into that again. Or we should just call it... And, and end it after this. But Okundale, your question. Hopefully we have enough time eh, to do this. <laughs> Hello? 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 Yes. Hello, George. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can Hello, hear can you, you please. Me? I can hear you. Okay, good. I, uh, Ogundele from Nigeria. Yes. Uh, let me start by saying that I admire your courage and your Thank dedication you. to your beliefs. Uh, Nigeria and Kenya, we have we have things in common in terms of complexity when it comes to uh, government setup, and uh, probably uh, let's say the ecosystem, the people's belief, and uh, your area. I think it's 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 a very very dangerous area, especially in Africa, and I admire your courage for that. Uh, let let me say let me say something about what I've I've actually learned from. Uh, the uh, the age, uh, this uh, community, the learning community so far. I, I'm seeing innovation from a new way. I think, and, and I thank God that I'm part of this. I, I'm seeing innovation in in its simplicity. Uh, my my first question to you is number one. I assume that I I, I joined the the web uh, web a, a little late, and uh, I I don't know. Do you have um, uh, um, filmmaking background, or you are part of the artist before you you, you start. I mean, you start coming into the social innovation environment. I want to, I want to, I want to know that because I actually want to know what really motivated you to 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 do this. Uh, the second thing is, I am I am having a new no. idea on how to. Okay. Um, I'd like you to repeat the the so that just for clarity, repeat the first question again. The, the, uh, the first question is: I actually want to know your motivation. Is it that Motiv you came from from a movie background and you feel uh, using film will actually sink down into people, or 
I just want to know what what your motivation because this project is uh, like I, like what you just said now. It's it's a dangerous project, and then for someone to just put head and say yes, I want to see what is what is going to happen at the end of the day, and you prepare for the worst. I feel something motivated you to do this, so I want to know what's your motivation on that. Then, did you get the question? Hello, George. Hello. Yes, I'm waiting for the second question. Okay. Uh, the second question is, I'm, I'm having, I'm starting to have a new picture in my head on how to actually, because part of my project is changing people's mindset uh, okay. as regards white collar job. Our major problem in Nigeria here is unemployment. I think it's also applicable to almost African countries. So this storytelling concept is is taking a new shape in my head, and I think uh, people relate more to storytelling than any other concept you might want to be, especially in Africa. Uh, you have said you are going to help anyway. I think I'm going to I'm going to write a personal note to you on that. But beyond that, I want to see how after filming, uh, you know, you, you are producing film. Um, I want to relate with them based on as in one on one. We, we bring ourselves together in a place and we discuss our story as it regards unemployment. And uh, we bring it's it's a new concept. I am going to come up with it. But I want to I want to hear your opinion about that. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. I hope I have understood them. Um, George. Well, the, you raised very George. big, uh, very big um, <laughs> questions, and and I hope uh, I hope I can try and address them. Sorry, George. The first question is the question on on. Yes. Um, before you start, um, I'm pretty sure that we will be uh, dropped out of this conversation pretty soon. Um, so you can just start okay. to answer and I can start up a new session and then send around the link. Uh, so no problems, but um, I'm seeing a red bar in my screen and it means trouble. So we can be dropped every uh, at any point now, but um, just go ahead until it's gone, right? Okay. Um, well, the question of motivation, I feel, that um, uh, I'm a storyteller. Um, I'm a young person who lives in this city and I have relationships that I would love to keep. There are people that I value, uh, whose, whose lives are important to me. Um, and so my motivation is to, is to see these people thriving and living uh, and being equal citizens like they should be. So many people have asked me many questions. Uh, I've been asked, did you do this to get to become famous or to get uh, donor financing or um, to get an award globally? And really, uh, the sto the, this work was not one of those that we did from a place of ego. Um, and it's, the, it's one of the works that have costed us the most because I have been in in the jail um, uh, I've had many fights with my family uh, about this um, so the personal cost has been very very high um, so my motivations are very altruistic that um, this is a story that needs to be told that regardless of who tells it whether it's myself or some other people it is one story that must be told, and I was lucky that uh, of starting this project, I had the the psych, and I had the tools, and I had the team and the story. So all the factors, all the all all the roads le led to me. Uh, so so really. Uh, I guess that's my answer, that my motivation was that the story needs to be seen and heard. And so maybe later we would explore, we'll, we are going to explore many other ways to make sure that the film is seen or the stories are heard regardless of whether they're in film or any other medium. Uh, because I care about these people. Uh, I care about my relationships and the people I love. Uh, Yes, and I wouldn't want to see the people I love treated badly um, because of misunderstanding. Uh, the story of unemployment in Africa with the huge young populations who have um, uh, semi-skilled or uh, unskilled 
um, with the economies that do not produce as many jobs as they actually promise, with governments that are unable to um, create employment um, in the capitalistic sense of things. It's a big challenge. And so my question is, um, are you interested in the storytelling to show the deprivation or the relative lack of, jo of what happens when people don't have jobs? Or are you doing storytelling to motivate young people to be innovative, to find solutions for themselves? Or are you doing storytelling uh, as the job that you train young people to be storytellers, whether digital or using any other medium? So I feel the, um, the question is very broad, but there are many ways to look at it. And generally, it's communication. You can use storytelling to tell the story of your work to allow more people to identify with you and to support your work. Um, you can tell stories about uh, um, the young people who don't have jobs so that policymakers and businesses and uh, the corporate sector can start to get the nuances. Why aren't people unemployable? Why is the minimum wage not working? Because I know there is minimum wage in all our countries, but people don't get below a dollar a day. Um, uh, and why is, is that not working? Um, you can tell stories to show the disparities between uh, state promises, state efforts, and the reality on the ground. But most importantly is how do you empower people to tell their own stories? And if by telling their own stories they can actually get livelihood, um, that would be amazing. So. I'm willing to explore this further with you um, as to, because I, I don't have a lot of details of your context, but I am hoping that um, these are thoughts that you can start to explore um, also with your work. Uh, I'm glad I was not cut off. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay, I, I love that motivation part. Uh, all right. It's all right. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to come up with something. Something. Uh, yes. Because my email actually, is on the screen. Actually, actually, with 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 uh with our project, the present project we are working on, uh, we also yes. uh, we we are trying to like, uh, we understand that government cannot produce all the job that we needed. Uh, what they need to do is to give us the environment and jobs will be created by private sector. But the mentality is that government should, and one of our one of our uh, uh, of our campaign is it should be a collective effort, and we shouldn't actually wait for government to do everything. We we, we should do it ourselves. If government fails to do it, let's do it ourselves. We sustain ourselves, we empower ourselves, and we can have a bigger voice. I think that that's the sense of my project. But you know, with this, I, I'm seeing storytelling as you know as another tool. And it's a big tool and it's a plus tool from what I've learned from this space. Uh, that's why I'm thinking in that line. I'll I'll communicate with you then we we'll see we we'll see how far we can go with that. Thank you for your answers. Very useful. Thank answer. you. Thank you for your question. You. Thanks very much, Agundala, for your question and uh, your answers of course, George. George leaves us with a, a warm thank you for your time and your preparations and the great video. I'm, I'm hoping everybody will find the time to have another look at it. Um, it's on Slack. It's on our channel. It's worth the look. Right. It's only a short part. It's only a couple minutes, but it's a trailer for something bigger, George. Um, and when and how can people right. when and how can people see that bigger thing, that full movie? Sorry. When and how can people see the bigger thing, the full movie that you are um, that you are making? Well, um, well, there are many, many. Uh, when you go to the uh, festival uh, film website, um, let me open it right now. It's called storiesofourlives.org. Um, uh, there are many. Uh, film festival screenings if you uh, oh, yeah. tomorrow if you I mean like uh, from January we shall post all the screenings okay. um, that will happen around the world we have uh, about um, 15 different invitations from around the world 
Um, so if you should look at the screening schedule from January. We shall uh, publish them. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we are exploring many different uh, distribution contracts. And as soon as we have uh, um, uh, any, uh, I mean, once the court case, then we can uh, get distribution contracts and then um, we will publish them uh, on the website. But I'm sure by, by June next year, the film should be able to be in most parts of the world. Right. Thank you so much on behalf Thank of everybody, on everybody uh, on this group. And um, everybody, I assume, have um, recorded uh, George's mail address and his kind of invitation to um, contact him later on. Otherwise, it's already posted on Slack. So if you can um, and will, there it is again. Thank you, George. Very mindful. Um, thanks again, everybody, for your attendance, questions, George, for your presentation and your talk. And uh, I'm hoping to see uh, a lot more of you in the future. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it.